Luke chapter 13, beginning at verse 10. Put it here, it won't last here. Blocked in. Okay, good. <laughs> now you gotta pull that back to the top. Praise God. While he's getting that ready, let's turn the book, uh, Luke chapter 13, verse 10. We ready? Okay. Uh, first of all, let's, let's kind of set this up. Jesus is, yeah, I'll go move it. Let me go back. Okay. Okay, Jesus is teaching in the synagogue. Okay. Jesus is teaching in the synagogue. And where he is at the synagogue, he is getting ready. And while he's teaching there, you're going to find out concerning there's a situation that goes on. Because every time Jesus would come into a town, whether it was Jerusalem, whether it was Judea, whether it was Samaria, he always went to the synagogue. In other words, when he went there, he always went to church first to give the Jewish people the opportunity first. He came to seek them, and yet he came to seek them that are lost, meaning that he really came to seek the whole world. But he gave the opportunity to his chosen people first. So that was the opportunity that he said. Okay, so here we start. In Luke chapter 13, we find it says, the word of God says, now he, Jesus, was teaching one of the, in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And behold, there was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity 18 years and was bent over and could in no way raise herself up. I'm reading from the New King James. But when Jesus saw her, saw her he called her to him. And he said unto her, Woman, you are loose from your infirmity. And he said, and then he laid his hands on her. And immediately she was made straight and glorified God. Mm. Verse 14. But the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath. And he said to the crowd, there are six days in which men ought to work. Therefore, come and be healed on them and not on the Sabbath. Okay? We're going to deal with the situation first. Father, in the name of Jesus, God, I come to you and I ask right now, Lord, that you help us. Help us as we perceive, Lord, your word and as we declare your word, Lord, we ask, Lord, that your anointing would rest upon your servant. And, God, that we will be hearers and receive the word of God with gladness. And, God, that there will be a change and a transformation because of the spirit of the Lord that moves with the word. We know that your word will not return void. And so, God, we're asking, Lord, bring a change. Break up the follow ground, Lord. Bring a healing. Bring a restoration. We bind up every spirit of hindrance and every spirit that will be contrary to the word of God. We release the spirit of healing, Lord, that every infirmity will be broken. And God, we declare that today is the day of the Lord. And God, that we will receive, Lord, everything that you have for us today. That you might receive all the glory and all the honor and all the praise. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Give God a praise, please. Hallelujah. First thing I want to do is the situation. The situation in which it is, we find that Jesus first went to the synagogue. And while he was there, notice what it says in verse 11. It says, behold, there was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity for 18 years. For 18 years. 18 years is a long time. I mean, 18 years is almost a generation. 
You can raise a child in 18 years. So in 18 years, you can get all of the blessings of the Lord. 18 years, you can raise a family. For in 18 years, you can receive the good things out of your job. Out of 18 years, you can almost get a retirement over 18 years. I mean, in 18 years, there's a lot of things that can happen in 18 years that can be such a blessing to you. In 18 years, you can find yourself getting all, not only the blessings of the Lord, but in 18 years, you can develop all kind of technology. All kind of things can happen in 18 years. Look at our country, how much has changed in 18 years since 1920. And in the 20s, in the early, the 30s, and as years, each year, every 10 or 20 years, our nation changes drastically. And within this last 20 years, it has changed in such a dramatic way, you can't even keep up with what's going on. Hello, everybody. It's all right if you talk back to me now. <laughs> but in those 18 years, all the time while others was getting blessed, this woman was bound with an infirmity. It says, notice what, what was going on in this lady's life, the situation. But 18 years with her infirmity and pain for 18 years. Hmm. How, would it, how, would, how can you imagine 18 years of being bent over? Having her body and mind vexed with despair. Always looking at the ground for 18 years. The Bible said that she was bent over so much so that all she saw was knees and feet and ankles. Imagine seeing that for 18 years, not even lifting up your head, but constantly bent over. Not even able to raise your head for 18 years and in pain and suffering. Imagine how she felt emotionally depressed discouraged, not able to do certain things as others could. Wherever she went, all she saw was the ground for 18 years. It's a long time. You know, it's amazing that, that when you get sick, everybody come and see you. But let you get sick for a year or two. I mean, all of the visitors fall off. They fade into the background, but all of a sudden you find yourself all alone. And sometimes even your family members stop seeing you. So you can imagine this woman after 18 years, those that was used to be close to her is no longer with her. And I imagine that you said 18 years of this, of this crippling disease, evidently she wasn't born that way. Evidently, at one time, she was in good health. And evidently, in one, one season of her life, she was probably gorgeous and beautiful, and people looked at her, and young men desired to be with her. But this infirmity turned her life upside down. It just twisted her life. So she's not only bent, but she's twisted. The life has changed. Your life can change in a moment. And all of the people that, that was once around you and that, that gathered themselves around you are not around you any longer. They're no longer with you or your friends. They call you at a distance. So, so here she is, 18 years. She, she, she's bound by this. When I think about that, I think about my, my wife's auntie, Aunt Elena, in Puerto Rico. And we would go there and, and, and visit her family and, and be with all of her mother's sisters and brothers. And over the years, as, as time began to pass, they began to pass away. And before you know it, it was only one auntie left. That was Auntie Elena. And they was all very vibrant sisters and, and brothers. They would get together, and man, it would just be a, just a hilarious time, just a, a joyous time of seeing them together. We actually have a picture of them when they were all together, sitting on the back porch of Titi Elena. 
I mean, Titi Elba, on her porch. And that was the, the, the summer that I went, and I was enjoying the, the, the shore and enjoying the beach and end up getting sunstroke. So I spent most of my vacation jacked up, messed up, tore up, busted up, sitting on the back porch looking down into the, to the river at the Rio Grande. <laughs> but the last time that we saw her, she had went from five foot seven to four foot 11. From being taller than me, then being turning around being shorter than my wife, who's five feet. I don't know if she's five feet now. I don't know if I'm still the height. Because <laughs> age kind of seemed to shrink you. And I seem to be shrinking and lower and lower. You know. But when we remember seeing her, it broke our hearts to see the condition that she was in because when we first saw, it threw us in shock because she was bent over. Her back had curved in such a way that she could not look up. She was bent over to look at us when we used to look up at her. What infirmities can do to you. It can twist you, may not physically, but inside. He can bend and twist your spirit. He can turn you in such a way inside your spirit because an offense. Someone offend you can twist you up. Oh, we're getting quiet up in here tonight. But, but, but somebody that can hurt you or, or, or abuse you or do those things or even your past that you can't get rid of can keep you bent and twisted. And so God puts us in that kind of situation to let us know that Jesus is still here. Jesus is still in the room. And, and, and let, me, let me add to this that, that check this out. For 18 years, she came to church. She came to the synagogue for 18 years. Can you imagine 18 years? This woman bent over, going through the rain, going through the storms. Night and day, day and night, week after week, coming to church, bent over. Coming to church, to the synagogue every week. Because where did Jesus find her? In the synagogue. Where was she coming? To the synagogue. She didn't come to the synagogue to look for Jesus. Well, hello. That's a revelation. She was just coming because that's what she loved to do. So evidently it showed us that this woman had faith. Glory to God. Faith before she got her healing. Mm. See, we want people to have, to get the healing first. People want to get healed but not have the faith. But this woman had faith before she got her healing. Ain't that something? Faith for 18 years to keep coming to church bent over. People laughing and mocking at her kids, making a fun of her. How can you handle five or ten years of people talking about you? I said five years. Some can't even have a five minutes. <laughs> hmm. Five minutes and they've been out of shape. Hmm. You got enough nerve to talk about me. What, what, yeah, I, mean, I mean, they're all up in arms, you know. But here, here he tells them, he said, no, for 18 years she kept coming. Day after day, the faithfulness of this woman for 18 years, to, to show you here, she was already at the church. She was already at the synagogue. She was already there when Jesus came. Hallelujah. Oh, glory to God. She was already there. She was already being a woman of faith. See, that's what Jesus saw when he looked at her. Oh, glory to God. Because the Bible said that Jesus saw her. See, he didn't just see her, he saw her. See, it's the difference between just seeing, and he, in other words, he would say, I see you. I see you. In spite of what everybody else said about you, in spite of what the people are doing, looking at her, looking at her condition, 
Why is she coming in here today? Why? Jesus, why, I mean, you can imagine how all she, what she had to deal with day after day and week after week. It's amazing. All somebody do is just talk about somebody nowadays, and they won't, they'll start coming to church. All they, do, all they got to do is talk about your dress, honey. Oh, you a little, what kind of dress you got? And, and you hear it. You side hear it. Oh, oh, I ain't coming here no more. They don't even love nobody. They talk about you. I know, you know, just a little, little comment today. You know, it's amazing because that, that communication, a little word can upset people in such a way so they can stop becoming faithful. Oh, it ain't, it ain't that bad. Now, don't, don't forget about it, brothers. They can get you too. All you got to do is some of the brothers, you come in here and, and all the brothers, you got to huddle up and avoid you. You come in, all they huddle up. Hey, what's up, bro? Hey, hey, hey. They, they greeting everybody, but they ignore you. Huh? High-fiving everybody and giving everybody all the handshakes and everything. And you walk in, and like they, everybody just turn it back and, hey, hey. I bet you won't come here no more. Hello. You, you, you see how it is? Little offenses is what does it to people. We think it's the loudest, the big stuff. And guess what? The little offenses is what keeps you because you keep it in your spirit. You don't tell nobody. You just hold it on to it. Just, you just hold on to that nugget. And not knowing that while you're holding it on, it's bending you over. And then somebody else say something that bends you over more. It's, it's constantly, everything that, that builds up on it, it just continuously bends you and twists you. Hmm. Pretty soon you're walking down all bent and twisted, even though you look like you're straight. But your spirit is bent. It's twisted. It's hurt. It's wounded. Whew. Glory to God. Are we there yet? Glory to God. And look, 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 what, look what's happened after when Jesus looks at her. She was faithful even though before she got healed and crippled. She was faithful through the discouragement and the disagreement. She was persistent in her faith because she was on a mission. Her mission was, I love God no matter what. Y'all didn't hear me. I said... I love God no matter what or who or where or why. Nothing could stop her from coming to the synagogue or coming to church regardless of who they were, what they said. Oh, the scripture could find, oh, could I find any faith in the world today? Is there any faith? That's what God looks for. That's what God has declared. That's what God is searching for. He said, is there any faith? Is there anybody that, that believes? Anybody that trusts? Because people are losing all of their strength through the weakness of their faith. 2020 was a fun time, wasn't it? Hallelujah, hallelujah. What were you doing during 2020? Was your faith being built? Were you being strong or was fear your greatest companion? Hallelujah. Do you not know that the opposite of faith is fear? And the strongest weapon that the enemy used is fear. Fear kept a whole nation from receiving their promise. Fear of giants. But faith saw giants like ants. That's what faith saw. Joshua and Caleb had faith. They saw ants. We are more than able. But fear said, we are not able. We cannot do this. And God is declaring in the earth today, he's getting ready to do something so powerful that if we don't have the faith to believe it, we won't get it. We will miss it. Oh, glory to God. Shout me down now. Because the Savior, first the situation, now the Savior. The Savior saw her. Jesus saw her. Say he saw her. 
Oh, yes, he did. Oh, yes, he did. First he saw her. Then he spoke to her. Hmm. I, I love it when Jesus speaks. <laughs> because when Jesus speaks, things change. Atmosphere just totally changes. That's why we have such power in our words and our voices. We can change an atmosphere just by how we speak. Hallelujah. Oh, you don't think so? Oh, uh, I, I got two or three people saying, yeah. Okay. All right. Because there, there is that. And, and so when he saw her, the first thing he did is he noticed her by because he saw her. And he let her know that he saw her because he called her. God sees you. And when he sees you, then he, you're getting it. I say he sees you and then he what? All right. And when he calls you, then he, that calling is the speaking to you. That's how you know it's God. And in the time that we live now, you need to know the voice of God for yourself. Oh, God has blessed you with a shepherd. He's, he's blessed you with a man of God to teach you, but you have to know for yourself. If you don't know for yourself, you are going to get lost. Because times are changing so much, and so many voices are out here that if you don't know the voice of God, you will confuse him with that. Hallelujah. Put your spiritual ears on. Get that wax out. I hear you, Lord. Because God is declaring it. His word. I'm receiving it. And so here he speaks to her and he tells her, what, what does he tell her? He said, thou art loose from your infirmity. Now, now I, I noticed it as, as I looked at it. He, he spoke to her. But there was no reaction. <laughs> oh, glory to God. Oh, glory. He said, you're loose. But she didn't get healed yet. That's what my Bible said. I don't know what yours said. He spoke the word. But she had to first receive it. You know what I'm saying? And once she received it, he touched her. <laughs> oh, God. That's like me saying, I got $100 for you. Will you come and get it? And she said, there, say, I don't believe it. I'm telling you, I got $100. And she said, I don't believe it. Now, she don't believe I got $100. But if I go to my wallet and I pull out a hundred, I say, I got a hundred dollars for you. She gonna say what? I say, she gonna say what? She gonna believe it did, right? Well, see, that's what God's word is that you have to see it without seeing it. You have to believe it. See it without actually seeing it. Believe it without seeing it. So he said, you are loose from an infirmity. And the moment that he said it, she starts envisioning herself straightening out. And what he did is he touched her to confirm what she believed. Oh, God. Oh, he had to touch her to confirm what she believed and what she received. Because if I tell you I got $100 for you, until you put it in your hands, it's not valid. But you see it. Am I right? You believe it because you see it, right? But yet the confirmation is not there until you touch it. But oh, it's mine. <laughs> see, see that, that's a difference. She received it. She believed it. She received it. And Jesus said, because you received it, 
let me confirm your faith with the touch. Now, whatever you're going through right now, you got to first believe it. And when you believe it, you can receive it. And when you receive it, the confirmation will come. Usually we want the confirmation first before we believe it. You hear me? Because God knows exactly what that infirmity can do to your life. Now, let me show you what I'm talking about. Now, when I left here in July 2017, when we got to Ohio to be there with, with our grandchildren and kind of settle in, by November, my wife and I riding a bike. And we got less than a half a block away and I had to pull over because I was exhausted. We hadn't went anywhere. I was just, I'm, I'm tired, slow. And so we went, turned around, went home. And then I started walking. So that's we, because we, we walk every morning. We get together. And I couldn't hardly even walk. No more than from here to the back of the church. And I would be exhausted. You know, just out of breath, just tired. And my wife said, honey, I don't like what I'm seeing. I think you need to go to the doctor and get it checked out. So I went to the doctor to get it checked out. And when I went to the doctor, the doctor said, Mr. Campbell, you have some blockage in your heart. So what we're going to do in December, we're going to take you and we're going to give you a stint. Okay, because we run, we, they ran a few tests, and by, t by this time they finished all the tests and everything was in December. She said, well, what we're going to do, we're going to put a stent in you. So we're supposed to go to the hospital there in Elyria, where we live. But they said, no, we're not going to be able to do it because the best surgeon in the whole area is in downtown Cleveland. So we're going to have to transfer you from there down to downtown Cleveland. The day that I went into the hospital in Elyria, it snowed. And it snowed, and it snowed, and it snowed, and it snowed. We had a blizzard. And so they got me in the ambulance, and the ambulance could only do 10 miles an hour on the highway because it was just that blackout in the snow to get downtown. So we left at what, about 12? We didn't get there to about maybe 3 or 4 in the morning. That's how slow we were going. Snail's pace to get there. And so when I got there, I wasn't supposed to have the surgery till Friday. When I got there, they said, we had a cancellation. We're going to do it tomorrow. Okay? All right, great. He said, it ain't going to be no problem. We're going to go in there. We're going to put the stint in. And after we put the stint in, we'll let you go the next day. Good as we knew. You'll be all right. Okay? I go into surgery. I'm getting ready. I'm down in the, in the surgeon. And the surgeon come by and he talked to me. Mr. Campbell, we're going to put the stint in. And, and, and it was going to be a little while. And then we're going to get you all set up and ready. And Mr. Campbell, You'll be out finished, and we're going to set you all up, and you're going to be okay, brother. We're going to set you up. And I'm like, okay, great, great, great. Okay, they take me in the operation room, you know, and all of a sudden, bam, I'm out. Half hour. In a half hour, the doctor leaves this operation room, goes to my wife, and comes to my wife and says, Mrs. Campbell, we have his heart out on the side, and we're going to have to do, uh, you know, a quadruple bypass. 
And she said, yeah, go ahead, go for it. <laughs> I, his insurance is paid up, go ahead. <laughs> I got, I, I'll go for the money, yeah. <laughs> Now, you got you to gotta remember, I went under with the mindset that I'm getting a stint. I don't know what's going on. I'm out on the table with my heart out on the side of the table. <laughs> so when I wake up, I wake up in shock. Because I wake up and I got sure machines all around me beeping and chirping. Boop, dip, 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 dip. Bunk me, bunk me, bunk me. I'm like, what the, what in the world's going on? And I don't know what's going on. I got a tube down my throat. I got oxygen all over me. And I can't breathe, can't breathe. And I'm in shock because I'm like, this ain't no stint. <laughs> <laughs> what happened to the stint? <laughs> I mean, that, that, that's, that's a shock. I'm in shock. So I'm in and out. I'm in and out because, man, and I wake up with this, this pain. I'm like, man, what in the world did they do? <laughs> and it wasn't until they, so I, they, they came in and knocked me out. Bam, I went out, you know. <laughs> and they came in and they put the thing in there and the needle knocked me out. And when I finally come clear, check out, when I finally come clear, maybe the day, the next day, I asked my wife, I said, what happened? And she said, oh, well, they told me, they went in there, and the doctor came out after a half hour using surgery, and he told me, he said, your heart was on the side, and we were going to have to do it. I said, what? Put my heart back. <laughs> what is it doing on the side? Put it back. Put, I'll come here and tell him, put it back. Put, put his heart back in the body. <laughs> And so she told me what happened. I was like, I can't believe what happened. I was in shock. I, like, I, couldn't, couldn't, I got to get over this, you know. I got to get over this. <laughs> so, so God was able to work it out. So I was able to finally come through that. But, you know, that was a major shock. But to show you, see, now God was letting me know. See, I left in July. By let's see, October, so all this started kicking in. And December, I had the surgery. And God was letting me know if I had to, if I had stayed here as pastoring, I would not have made it. God was showing me His timing. See, we don't understand God's timing, but but when God does something, sometimes we think it's for the worst when it's really for the best. That's the worst thing that can happen to somebody, but yet it was for my best. See, because God realized this is a situation where the enemy can twist you and bend you and break you. And you could be done. But God used it and used it for his glory and brought out his glory. Now I got the heart of a 20-year-old. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I got a new heart. Hallelujah. The only thing I need is new knees. New knees. I'm working on it. Working on it. <laughs> I want to be able to run. Glory to God. <laughs> Woo, do my cartwheels. Glory to God. <laughs> Hallelujah. But you see, just as this, this woman was bent and, and, and Jesus saw her. See, Jesus sees us and he sees the situation that we're in. And when he sees it, he knows exactly what's going on that we don't even know. Because a lot of times, this woman over the years have gotten adjusted to what she was. You hear me? She got adjusted to her condition. And the scripture is very clear. It says she had a spirit of, a, in a, of infirmity. So that spirit had bent her and kept her in that position. See, the enemy want to put you in a position that you're no longer functionable. He's crippling the church today. A lot of folks don't come to church 
and they're bent and they're twisted. And they're afraid. What is there to fear? If God going to take you, he going to take you. Where's your faith in God? See, God is already, he's already showing, there's a lot of things that is coming out that people are showing you that a lot of the stuff that's out here isn't what you, is, you got to understand, CNN and all of them, they're not the Bible. They're not the word of God. And we are men and women of faith. We believe what God says, not the report of the man. Because who report do you believe? Whose report do you believe? The Bible is very clear. He was bruised and he, he was wounded for our transgression. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. By his stripes we're healed. Jesus is not coming back for a frayed, weak, Minnie Mouse church. He said he's coming back for a glorious, victorious church. I said a glorious, victorious, and that is not what, I, that is not what you see in the world today. If anything, that need, need to be stand up and need to be the church of God. Do you not know now is our time? Now is the time for the church of God to reign in power. God has given us the authority. He's given us the most powerful weapon in the entire world is the Holy Spirit. And we're sitting on it. We're hiding it. We're not letting him operate in our lives like he should. Not like he's going to, but what he should. He should be operating in our life. We are men and women of authority. I said authority. The devil's supposed to be running from us. I said he's supposed to be on the run. He does not, he does not run from people that don't have no authority. Matter of fact, he come and sit up in their church. That's right. Singing the choir. He even have enough nerve to stand behind the pulpit. Sit and give you some watered down milk toast message that make you feel good to go home. Nothing to challenge your spirit, to stir you up, put a fire down in your soul that you want to do something powerful and anointed for God. That's what God looks for. Where are my fire starters? <laughs> oh, see, we're supposed to start fires. Quit putting them out. Fire starters. Start the fire. Start the fire. <laughs> Hallelujah. Let the Holy Ghost start the fire in you. That everywhere you go, you spark and fire wherever you go. Fire starters. Hallelujah. That's what God is looking for. Fire starters.